Okay, class, I want to continue to talk about the arthropods. We've already discussed some uh, major features of arthropods in class. And um, I'm putting this slide up here just as a reminder because the arthropods are so diverse that they're divided into these different groups. And as you recall, the um, trilobites are, are all extinct, so we're not saying a whole lot about them. Um, and if you think of the arthropods in four major groups, the chelicerates, the crustaceans, the insects, and the myriapods, um, you can kind of organize the arthropods in your mind a little bit more. So the chelicerates have mouthparts called chelicera, and they include arachnids, which include spiders and other arachnids, such as scorpions and ticks and mites. And also the horseshoe crabs are um, in the subphylum chelicerata. People tend to mix them up and think that they're crustaceans, but they're not. They're actually chelicerates. Then we have crustaceans, which you're fairly familiar with, the decapods being the most common, but there are other kinds of crustaceans, um, insects, and then myriapods, which include millipedes and centipedes. So if you think of those four major groups uh, distributed across um, a couple of different subphyla, um, I think that will help to organize the arthropods in your head a little bit. Okay. So moving along, we, we were talking a lot about uh, features of insects, and, um, uh, and uh, I'm going to come back to some of those, but I wanted to start with uh, a little bit of the anatomy. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I want you to do this in lab if you haven't already, where you're looking at mouth parts. So again, the incredible diversity of the insects makes it hard to make generalizations. And so this is using a grasshopper, which is an orthopteran, the order orthoptera, uh, to show some general features of um, insects that have mandibles for mouth parts uh, and the mandibulata, as we've talked about. So um, you can see some features of the head. There's the compound eyes. Um, the the uh, fronds and the clypeus, the labrum, which kind of cover some of the other mouth parts. When you're um, looking at your grasshopper in lab, you can yank these parts off. If you take the um, maxillary palp and pull off a piece, um, it'll probably still contain um, some parts of um, the labrum when you're pulling it apart. And then you can also look at the labial palps, maxillary palps, um, underneath here is where you'll see the actual mandibles. So you'll see these sort of outer coverings of the labrum and the clypeus, and that underneath are the two mandibles. Here they've been pulled apart. Obviously they come together um, right here in the insect. And so you can locate them under there as well. So take a look at some of those other pieces. So again, the, the, these are... Um, Mouth parts for many kinds of insects, especially orthopterans and other chewing, biting insects. Um, but there's an incredible diversity of mouth part types, which of course leads to the diversification and radiation of insects into different kinds of habitats. So you might expect that how they feed goes along with where they live and what they do. So I always want you to kind of have that ecological evolutionary context in mind when you're thinking about the anatomy and morphology of, of these critters. And so we have um, uh, in A here our nasty little mosquito that nobody <laughs> likes, but they have these amazing mouth parts that are designed almost like a hypodermic needle to inject into a small arteriole or venule of a vertebrate host and, and suck blood from it. So um, very amazing, interesting co-adaptation, co-evolution with um, their prey species. And then we have uh, butterflies that have these sort of uh, lapping. The maxillae have been modified into this drinking, lapping kind of structure that will uncoil and lap up um, liquids. Usually butterflies seek uh, salty and sugary fluids. Um, <clears throat> in C here is a honeybee that also have uh, sort of drinking labial palps, okay? And although the mandibles are still present, they've been sort of modified. And um, in E, we have a, a fly. So uh, many of the dipterums have these sort of sponging mouth parts, so they kind of sponge up fluids. So, so, and again, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of mouth part 
uh, diversity, but when you're thinking about the orders of the insects and looking at their differences, looking at wing differences and looking at mouth part differences, along with the tagmatization uh, and how things have been modified for those groups is, is one of the ways to kind of keep it all um, uh, organized in a, a bit. All right, so let's talk about flight. Um, the fact that insects can fly is certainly a major evolutionary innovation that's responsible um, in part for the incredible diversification and abundance of insects on the planet. Uh, of course, insects have been able to occupy every habitat that we know of, um, with the exception of, you know, under big ice sheets and the, in, in Antarctica and, and such. Um, and, um, or, or being on the ocean floor, like other arthropods are down there, but insects aren't. But insects are just about everywhere else. And being able to disperse there, being able to get there, is a major hurdle that insects have been able to overcome because they can fly or they can at least get up high enough to catch wind currents and use both passive and active flight to disperse into different kinds of habitats. Um, so the wing, um, and I should have some better pictures here, but the, the wing is basically just a lateral outfolding of the body wall um, as opposed to other sorts of appendages. They've evolved a little bit in a different way. And originally, wings probably evolved for uh, creating more surface area, as we know. Having that increased surface area to volume ratio allows for greater exchange, especially for gases and for heat exchange. So probably for thermal regulation and for gas exchange were, were the reasons that um, wings originally evolved. And um, as you can imagine, once structures are in place, that uh, evolutionary pressures eventually led insects to use wing-like structures for flight. <clears throat> now, in the most, uh, so, so there's, there's sort of two major groups of um, wings in terms of the more primitive and more advanced insects. And again, these are generalizations, so there's some different types out there as well. But if we look at, um, primitive insects such as a dragonfly, um, which is actually um, shown in the uh, <clears throat> in this picture here in A. Sorry, I'm losing my place for a minute. And what um, what happens with a with a dragonfly and um, butterflies, other primitive insects, is that you simply have muscles that are attached to the wing itself. There's a fulcrum. Um, and then when the muscle contracts, there's one nerve impulse, one muscle contraction, wing goes down, relaxation, wing goes back up. So a couple of muscles involved, simple, simple contraction and extension, just like moving your arm up and down. So primitive insects, um, don't fly very fast. If you think about looking at a dragonfly or a butterfly and how slowly they flap their wings, you can relate it to this um, anatomy here where you have a simple contraction and relaxation, um, one nerve impulse, one muscle contraction, one wing beat. And so they don't go very fast. All right. And so these are called um, direct flight muscles because the muscles are directly um, controlling the wing beat one for one. And this is in contrast to more um, advanced insects such as flies or uh, hemipterans, which are true bugs, um, hymenopterans. As you know, when you've looked at a bee or a fly, they're buzzing their wings so fast that you can't even see them move. And the question is, how do they accomplish um, flight like this. And so these sorts of insects have what are called indirect flight muscles as opposed to the direct flight muscles of the lepidopterans and the odonates or the butterflies and the dragonflies. Um, and um, they're, they're indirect in the sense that the muscles are attached to the notum, which is the plate that goes uh, uh, across over the um, thoracic area <clears throat> under, underneath where muscles are attached. And if you think of the notum as um, that toy, there used to be a little toy, <laughs> a disc-shaped toy that was a piece of rubber, a convex piece of rubber, and then you would press it in 
and you set it on the table and you wait several seconds and then boom, it kind of jumps in the air. I don't know if you guys remember that toy. I should bring one in if you don't. Um, but basically what that little disc is doing is it's storing energy. You press it in, you set it down, it's storing energy, and then finally it slowly pops up. And so this popping up releases a whole bunch of uh, kinetic energy all at once. So <laughs> by the same kind of feature, um, the indirect flight muscles of flies and bees will contract and pull that notum down, just like pressing in that little disc, okay? And then there's this um, little uh, pivot here where the wings are sort of indirectly attached, so they're not directly attached to the wing, okay? Here, the muscle's actually directly attached to the wing, and then in the indirect flight muscles, the muscles are attached just to the notum. All right, so the muscles pull the disc down and then it pops up and with all that energy, you get many, 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 many wing bites, uh, wing, sorry, wing flaps happening all at the same time. Okay, so <clears throat> in addition, you have one nerve impulse that can cause many, many muscle contractions and then even single uh, muscle contractions that can cause many, many wing beats. Okay, so this is how you get wing beat frequencies that are like um, hundreds to a thousand wing beats just even in a second. All right, so these indirect flight muscles are responsible for these incredibly fast rates of flight. And remember also that um, insects use striated muscle, which allows for greater um, activation, oxygenation, and overall higher activities that um, allow for flight as well. Okay, so um, we could say a lot more about the different ways in which different insects fly and um, how that's uh, allowed them to occupy different habitats, but we only have so much time. So just want you to think about the direct and indirect flight muscles. Um, sometimes they're called synchronous and asynchronous because if you have one nerve impulse that leads to several muscle contractions that the nerve impulse and the muscle contractions aren't in sync. All right, so moving along um, to the tracheal system. So of course, when you're really active and you're flying around and you're moving a lot and using a lot of energy and probably eating high uh, sugar containing compounds to help support that activity, um, insects also evolved a fairly complex respiratory system, which we haven't really seen much of before. Um, many of the other invertebrates that we've talked about, primarily because they're aquatic or marine, rely primarily on diffusion for gas exchange. And now we're looking at an actual respiratory system. And in this case, they have tracheal systems, um, not uh, completely unlike uh, respiratory systems that we're f familiar with in, in mammals. Okay, so, what you have is um, an opening to, in, the, in the outside of the body. Let me see if I have um, this next picture here kind of shows it a little bit better. I'm going to go back to that other one. But if this is the outer body wall. There are little holes or openings called spiracles. And you should look for the spiracles in the grasshopper. You'll see little holes along the side of the abdomen. And the air will come in containing oxygen through the spiracle and enter into the tracheal system which will continue to branch and branch again and, and branch again until it distributes um, oxygen containing air throughout the tissues of the organism. And, and finally, um, the trachea branch into really fine um, branches called tracheoles. And the tracheoles are in contact with uh, muscle fibers and are actually fluid filled at these very ends and pretty much intracellular at this point. So there's um, a exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide at the tracheals from the tracheal fluid into the muscle fiber and back. Um, notice that the circulatory system doesn't really play a role here in oxygen CO2 exchange, which is kind of interesting. There's just this direct um, uh, transfer of oxygen and pickup of CO2 um, without involving any circulatory fluid just from the tracheal system, which is pretty interesting. So here you can see um, branching of trachea into tracheals, um, and here you see trachea, tracheals, and the intracellular tracheal 
endpoints with the muscle cells. And then there's um, the spiracle here. So um, again, uh, very efficient for bringing large amounts.